it's been a while but I'm finally back with another video for our wind load playlist. Today we're going to cover the directional procedure part two and at the end we're going to compare that method with the previous two methods that we used which was the envelope procedure part one and part two and we're going to see that there's a major difference when using the directional procedure versus the envelope procedure so let's go right in. As I did with the other videos, I'm presenting here first the overall diagram that shows where all wind load related chapters are in ASC 7, in this case 716. And we can tell we can see here that chapter 26 is where we see all the general requirements. We went in chapter 28 in the previous two videos and we explored first we did part two of the envelope procedure and then we went with part one for the same building in West Palm Beach, Florida. And now in chapter 27, we have what is called the directional procedure. And we also have part one and part two. And also keep in mind that part two is typically like a simplified version of part one for these two chapters. Today, we're going to cover part two, the simplified version. And then the next video, we're going to cover part one. And after that's all done, we're going to have one building that is possible to do in all four different methods or possible to derive wind loads for and we're going to see how they all compare so today we're going to have a comparison of three different methods essentially and finally we're actually going to be pretty surprised i was pretty surprised to find out that there is a major discrepancy when you go from the envelope procedure to the directional procedure obviously with all these methods we have limitations we can't use that method for all heights or all different types of building shapes and whatnot. For this specific method, we have the, the following limitations. First, the height needs to be less than 160 feet. Second, the building needs to be regular shaped. It needs to be enclosed and have a simple diaphragm. And I believe I mentioned in previous videos what a simple diaphragm building is. It's essentially a building with vertical spanning elements aka walls spanning vertically to the diaphragm and then the, the diaphragm spans horizontally to the lateral load resisting system so if you have a building that doesn't follow this general configuration if you have things spanning horizontally for example then you cannot use this method and then the building must be either class one or class two so another definition that gets introduced in this chapter for class one building the building is essentially a little bit shorter, it's up to 60 feet, and then the ratio of the length over the width needs to be between 0.2 and, and 5. And then class 2 buildings, the height is a little bit more, so it's 60 to 160, and then so the building can be a little bit taller, but then the aspect ratio is more limited, it's between 0.5 and 2. Also, because this building is a little bit taller here, then the natural frequency is limited to this number here. That's essentially saying that your building cannot be too flexible. Now for our steps, we have the same table that we had before in all these different methods. It's nice that ASC 7 uh, has all these specific well-defined steps that we can always reference when we start a calculation for wind loads. So we see all these steps here, very similar to before, just guiding us to different tables. The main difference here, and as you can tell in this figure, is that we have just one net pressure. So we don't have pressures on the other side of the building, it's just the, the overall net pressure combining windward and leeward. But when you actually apply this in your model, there are footnotes within the tables that tells you how to split between windward and leeward, but to get the base shear, for example, we only need this initial pressures here or the net pressures because they are already combining both the windward and leeward for us. And as I highlighted here, the main difference between this method and all the other methods is that here you get your pressures specifically from the table. You don't have to do a whole lot of math besides interpolation, as we're going to find out here in a second. So this is our problem statement, our building the same exact building as what we have done in the previous two buildings or two examples. The first step is to determine the building class because now we know this is a new concept. 
and then after that we're going to determine the the net pressures on walls at the top of the wall and at the bottom of the wall because if I go back here a couple of slides you see here that you ha we have P sub notch and we have P sub H that is the pressure at the base of the building P sub notch and then P sub H at the roof height in our case we don't have a sloped roof so at the the very top of the building which is 25 feet and then after we determine the wall pressures we're going to determine the net roof pressures per that table referenced and then we'll calculate the total base shear and uplift there is one more thing here that's not within our steps because our topographic factor is one so we don't have to adjust the values that we get with any different uh, adjustment factor for k sub zt because in step number six here it essentially tells us that we need to determine the topographic factor and apply this factor to the wall and roof pressures if applicable and then there's also another factor that's not mentioned here but it's within the roof tables that tells us to adjust our roof pressures if we are not exposure c in our case because we are exposure c i'm leaving that step out so this is not a template this is specific to our building so we need to make sure that if we were to use these calculations for another building that we uh, multiply the wall pressures or roof pressures by the appropriate adjustment factors so as we continue here with our steps then we need to calculate the total base shear and uplift and finally compare this method with the envelope procedures from part one and part two all right so determine the building class and as we learned we have class one and class two class one is for buildings up to 60 feet in height and then if you're above 60 feet but up to 160 then we are in class two because our building is only 25 feet in height we are essentially in class one I still calculate the aspect ratios here down below for us to know for sure that we are within these parameters here for class one which b over l is 1.33 therefore if we divide this by l we have b over l has to be greater than 0.2 and less than 5 so we're within these parameters i also calculated here l over b for both load case a and load case b you may be wondering what what is the difference between the two um, this is covered in other methods as well but i'm going to remind ourselves here that on plan our building is 90 feet in this direction and 120 on the other direction and let's go back here a couple of slides just to confirm so we do have 90 feet and 120 here and the height is 25 so when the wind is blowing parallel to the short direction that's essentially wind a when the wind is blowing parallel to the long direction that's wind b okay and i am also calculating here this l sub l over b ratios because we're going to need that in a second to extract our pressures from the the respective tables second step here is to, to determine the net wall pressures at the both the top and also the bottom of our walls and as a reminder this includes both windward and leeward pressures so this initial table here up above we see is from its table 27.5-1 it gives us pressures for 160 and 180 and then different ratios for l sub b or l over b in our case for wind a our l over b is 0.75 so we are somewhere between here and somewhere between here but for 170 i went over here and created this table to interpolate to 170 so you can do this on your own and compare these values to make sure that i'm correct i try to really double check these things to make sure that all my numbers are appropriate so that we compare apples to apples here with the other methods and i got these these pressures i'm not going to bore you with the interpolation here but these are the numbers that i got for p sub h and p sub notch and then in summary i got these pressures here now we're going to determine the net roof pressures per table 
the table looks very similar to the previous tables that we the previous table that we saw here for the the walls now we are doing essentially for the roof the same thing but for the roof note that this is already saying uh, this table is for exposure C. If it wasn't exposure C, we would have to adjust it accordingly. I believe the wall pressures, they give them for different exposures, but the roof pressures, they only give it to expo for exposure C and you have to adjust it with another factor. And then I did the same interpolation here and found these pressures for the three roof zones. And if you're wondering what, what these roof zones are, you can see here that for wind A or wind B, you have zone three, zone four, and zone five, and it's going to vary based on the height of the building. So in our case, up to, what is it, 20, 12 and a half feet, we would have zone three, because that's half of the building height, height which, which is 25, and then 12 and a half feet again here, and then the remainder would, go zone, would be zone five. So we see here, our zone areas. For wind A, we have a zone area of 120 times 25 because the wind is blowing parallel to the short direction. So the projection area for the wall is the long direction, 120 times the height, 25. And then we did the similar thing for load case B. We get our zone area per se. And then here, I'm essentially calculating the, uh, I'm saying it's the average because I'm calculating the area of the trapezoid here. Essentially, I have pressure going like this, going like this, and going like this, right? So the area of this geometry here is P sub naught plus P sub H divided by two, P sub naught plus P sub H divided by two times the height. So that's why essentially if I'm just trying to get the average pressure, that's going to be accurate to the actual total base shear that I'll get. And then I get my two base shears here. I know for previous videos, I was doing a whole lot of comparison between wind loads for walls that they need to be at least 16 PSF. And then for the roof, the roof projection needs to be at least eight PSF. For our case here, it's okay by inspection. So I'm not going to just expand these, these tables here and maybe create a little bit more confusion. I know I, I got a lot of questions from one of the previous videos. So I'm just stating here, note one, that these wall pressures, they are greater than 16 PSF. So I don't need to calculate the base shear for 16 PSF. And then for the roof pressures here, I have a similar note stating that these pressures here for the roof are all greater than the 8 PSF minimum, therefore, this controls over the code minimum checks. And then I get here my total uplift when I add up all these zones and I went, already went over how to calculate the area of, of each zone. Then I do the same thing for wind B or load case B and I get my total wind uplift, which is very similar to load case A as we would expect. Now we finally got to the meat of our problem. It's when we really compare this method, which is the directional procedure part two with the envelope procedures part one and part two. So the first thing here that I outlined are the base shear numbers and the uplift numbers for both load case A and for load case B. And if we look here, there is a big number that sticks out to us, right? Which is this 49%. Essentially for base shear, if I compare 132 with 196, there was a 49% increase, which to me is huge. And if you want to double check my numbers, please go ahead and do so. If there's anything that I missed there, please let, let us know in the comments. But it is a major, major discrepancy or major, major difference between the different methods. And then if we go to load case B, it goes from 96 kips all the way to 41 kips, which is a 46% increase. For uplift, we have an increase of 12% on load case A and 10% on load case B, which that is an increase, it's not huge, but the main one is on base shear. And I created this couple fancy graphs here for us to interpret all these results or just to see them a little bit better. And you can see here that in 
red, we have uplift, and there was a small jump here, and it actually went down when we compare it to between envelope part one and envelope part two, but these are very similar, the two of them, and then there is a little bit increase as we go to the direction procedure part two. Same thing happens here for load case B, B as we would expect, and then a small increase for the, the directional procedure. But the real surprise is down below where we look at essentially the same base shear between envelope part one and envelope part two. And then we look at the same, or virtually the same base shear for load case B. But then the increase is huge here and it's huge here. So why do we have that increase? meaning if you're designing a low rise building that essentially is applicable to all these different, with all these different methods, why is the all heights method or not the all heights method, the directional procedure part two, the all heights method will be part one. And we'll see when we finalize part one, which is the all heights method. But if it follows the same trend, it will be similar to part two, right? The directional procedures will give similar loads and then the envelope procedures will give similar loads when compared to each other. But if you compare envelope to directional, there will be a major discrepancy, especially in base shear, which is what we noticed here. It's worth noting that the research that went into the envelope procedure was specific for low rise buildings and the, and the pre-engineered metal building industry put a lot of money into that research. One of the major differences is that it, we saw in the previous videos that it captures the corners of the buildings and all these corner zones, which for the directional procedure, it's just the direction, right? We don't really capture the, the corners of the buildings. We only capture the overall zones when we are talking about wall pressures. So that's one of the major discrepancies. And then Perhaps because of all the research and all the testing that was done specifically for low rise buildings, those numbers got a little bit more accurate or a little bit more refined for low rise buildings. Whereas the directional procedure up to 160 feet or the all heights method that is applicable to a much wider range, which maybe becomes a little bit more accurate to a wind tunnel test, for example, when you get to a certain height. But if you go to a low rise building, that wouldn't resemble the same practical results as a wind tunnel study as the envelope procedure. That's my take. Let me know if you have a different opinion or more insight into why these two methods are so different when comparing a building that's applicable to all of them. If you want to download this example in a spreadsheet format, you can head to the description below, click on that link, and I'll email this spreadsheet directly to you. And I'll see you next time.